Hey everyone. Hey Jen. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Welcome to Hot Pot Talks. Jen, I think we've been waiting. It feels like weeks for this. I'm so excited about this. <laughs> yes. Hello. Welcome to Hot Pot Talks. Um, my name is Jen Sunshine and we are coming to you live from the unceded, occupied and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil nations. You might know us as the co-founders and co-artistic directors of Love Intersections, a media arts collective that produces documentary film about queer BIPOCs. In honor of Lunar New Year, year of the metal ox, I had this little prop Amazing. here. I know. Um, David and I came up with Hot Pot Talks to combine our love for Hot Pot and for talking. This is a weekly series launching today, happening every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific time, where we have free-flowing conversations with artists, activists, chefs, performers, poets, and community organizers about what it means to be an artist facing today's realities, what ethical responsibilities do we have as artists, what organizing and making art looks like during quarantine, all the while sharing our favorite hot pot ingredients. So why hot pot talks? Yeah, so I thought, you know, since this is our first hot pot talks, I wanted to give a little bit of context to how this came about. Um, so Jen and I, as Jen mentioned, are members of Value Co-op, the Vancouver Artist Labor Union Cooperative. Um, and we, our studio is located in the Lim Sai Hor Kao Mok Association in Chinatown. Um, and, you know, when we, when we moved into uh, the neighborhood, we had a lot of conversations about what it meant to move into Chinatown and also recognizing um, the ways that artists have sometimes contributed to gentrification. And we wanted, where we landed was we wanted to have generative conversations about how we can actually contribute to the neighborhood um, and to in solidarity with the struggles um, that are in, in the neighborhood. And so, um, a, a little bit of background as well, It's because there's a personal connection. Um, we were invited um, to uh, rent the studio because I've, I've worked in the building for um, actually almost 20 years now. Um, I work with um, Hello Cool World um, and uh, Kat Dodds, the co-founder, has lived in that space for several decades um, and works out of that space. Um, and so um, how this, uh, this particular uh, project uh, came about um, was we're doing this year we're doing a collaboration with the Lim Association, the elders on the board, on a project called Engaging Chinatown. So part of what we're going to be doing is helping them digitize their archives. Um, and originally we were going to have a um, turn the archives into an immersive visual art exhibit. Um, unfortunately, of course, COVID had other plans for us. Um, and how this came about was, you know, Jen and I, Jen, you and I sat down one day and we're kind of bummed out about the the, the ways that we weren't able to do um, certain types of art, but we wanted to also sit with what we could do and to continue these sort of community dialogues um, on um, and community cultivation uh, dialogues in, in other formats. So um, that's sort of how this uh, live stream uh, Hot Pop Talks came about. I also just wanted to mention um, uh, Value Co-op, we have a no surpluses, no profits, no kickbacks a mandate. And so surpluses or profits, um, quote unquote, from the organization, um, they go back um, into hiring artists um, and to the community projects working group. And so this collaboration we're doing with um, the association this year is linked to this um, the, the, the community um, project working group that we're, that we're, Jen and I are a part of. Yeah, and so the, this idea of the hot pot, Jen and I were talking about sort of thinking about this idea of the hot pot as connecting with community. It's literally warm, so warmth. Um, thinking about Chinatowns as nourishment. Um, the ceremony of hot pot, so like sharing food, the communal, communal nature of it. And also the different types of hot pot. So in Asia, there's tons of different types of hot pot, all the, and all actually all over the world. Fondue, you know, we can think of fondue also as a form of communal hot pot mm -hmm. food sharing. Um, and also thinking about like the variety of food that's in hot pot. So thinking about the different textures, the meta using that as a metaphor for different textured conversations in, in community. Um, yeah, so this is just our opportunity to make art despite the pandemic um, and to connect with, um, with, with all of you. So before we introduce our esteemed guest, Claire Yao. Um, we want to just do some acknowledgements. We've got our 
um, lovely practicum student, Cameron, who's in the back end working endlessly, managing the tech, the comments, um, different banners that will invariably show up throughout um, this broadcast, uh, this, this talk. Um, I, David, is there anything else we should, who we should acknowledge? Yeah, and we, and we also have on our on our team also Lamia, um, yes. Ava, Jessica, and Victoria, who are also have who have been really supporting the um, our really fun what I think is our really fun social media campaign. So thank you guys. Yes. Um, so I just may I'll also mention one thing. Um, if we'll, we're gonna, try, I don't know if we're, this is gonna work, but if you want to ask a question or if you want to make a comment or um, converse with us, you can. We actually see the comments come through. Um, and th I don't know if this is going to work, but try it out. <laughs> Cameron might ask you some questions in the chat as well. We'll try to we'll try to communicate or have dialogue somehow as well. I mean, this is the first time we're doing this, so there's going to be some bumpy <laughs> bumpy um, things. <laughs> uh, well, okay, so let's just do this. So without further ado, let's welcome our very first guest, Claire Yao. Hello. Hi, Claire. Hello. Hi, David. Hi, Jen. Hi. Welcome. How Thank are you? you? I'm good. I mean, you guys know, but there is a power outage in downtown Vancouver right now. And so I got to my studio and had to rush right back here. And now I'm in my bathroom. So <laughs> doing pretty OK here. <laughs> Amazing. Um, maybe, actually, why don't you tell us a little bit about your bathroom? I see that there is tons of Ooh. art in the back there. Uh, and my head is <laughs> blocking one of my favorite prints. These two, the East Van Cross and the um, Newtown Bakery one here is, um, they're done by an artist, a local artist named Wan Kang. Um, and just, yeah, one, I, I live in a studio apartment, don't have much wall space. So the bathroom is where I like to put up some art um, there in my living room. So this is my little, like I live in East Van, I work in Chinatown, loving the crows that commute home. So this is my wall of like places that have a, a connection in my heart. Amazing. How's that? And David, I would like to have you introduce your display of food here. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> this has been, okay, this has been like many, many weeks of preparation because <laughs> I also didn't know what would be visible as well. So I tested this out on the weekend. So we have a little mushroom selection over there. It's actually a hot pot pack from, um, from TNT. Um, and I'm in love with chanterelles. So that's, that's that. Um, yeah, and some fish balls and some udon and a little steamy pot. I don't know if you can see the steam anymore, but. <laughs> so, no, I cannot. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Jen, how, how about you, Jen? Listen, I really tried. Um, I was <laughs> really trying to go for the minimalism uh, route. But I did force my partner to cut out, you know, repurpose this like birthday banner that I had going on Monday. And I just got my partner to like cut up some text. So we just created hot pot talks. And then that was Amazing. that. I originally had balloons, but it was a little bit too much to look at. So <laughs> vetoed, vetoed it. Um, well, I feel like yeah. maybe for our first, since this is our very first hot pot talks. I thought maybe we'll start with um, what I'm curious because Claire, we had a little back and forth over email. Are each of our stories of hot pot um, are and our own connections to to that? Um, do you want to do you want to start, Claire? Sure. I mean, when you asked um, me what my favorite hot pot ingredient was, I immediately thought of this one thing that I don't know the name for. And so I'm on Google trying to Google what this like hollow tube squishy, like is it a squid? Is it a fish ball? I actually still don't know the name of it, to be honest. It's like uh, white and beige and I don't know, but I like it. And so part of my diasporic journey is Googling the heck out of a lot of like cultural things. Um, yeah. So that's that's my, that's my, um, that was a little bit of a something I was doing, but my family we called it steamboat. We're from Singapore, and mm -hmm. um, so hot pot is actually like a very Vancouver thing that that was introduced to me. And we didn't steamboat that often, but I always do have really fond memories of doing it. 
And I also confirmed with my parents, who are watching right now in Ontario, Hello. Hello. Um, Hello. Uh, that we didn't have a dipping sauce. So that's something that like we just never did. So you cook the broth at the start, and then you've got your individual bowls, but you don't have a dipping sauce. So that is new to me. Uh, what about for you guys? Fascinating because I, we, Dave and I were just having this exact conversation around how everybody seems to have like a very different story with Hot Pot and different origins, um, like origin stories with Hot Pot, similar to kind of what you just described. David, I feel like you, you've, you've talked a little bit about that. Yeah, actually, um, uh, Claire, it was the same. I, we didn't really do Hot Pot as a family. It wasn't until I was introduced to it, I think in high school, I went to a friend's um, place and they we, we were having hot pot. I was like, "What is this?" And then I was like, blown away. I don't know why. It's just so fun. It's I think it, 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 as I mentioned earlier, like I, there's something about the variety and like all the different textures, um, and it's just fun. Like and I I don't know. Maybe it's also because I really like cooking too. But it's just there's something participatory around it too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but since that, like my family and I, I think are like hardcore hot pot. Like literally I would say, and given I have a tiny fridge, like a third, maybe that's an exaggeration. <laughs> I'm just saying, talk, thinking about the shelf space. It's all the little jars of sauce. And every single time I go out to eat hot pot, because different restaurants of course will have different, mm -hmm. you know, the, the bars will just have just gotten bigger and bigger and bigger of, of dipping sauces, right? Wow. So I'll, I'll get like different ideas and stuff like that. I'm really into, um, I accidentally discovered this as a hot pot ingredient, yuzu paste. Oh. Yeah, so it's like, it's it's spicy. It's I, I, I bought a couple of jars when I was in Japan last year, screening Love Intersections films. And uh, I just discovered it has this sort of nice sort of, it's spicy. And there's also kind of like citrusy, zesty zing to it. That's kind of fun. Yeah, so that's sort of my, it's the one I'm, I'm, I really like right now. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I would, I would say for me, I grew up with hot pot. I was born in tai Taipei, Taiwan. And there's just the streets are lined with hot pot shots, shops. And I would like with my family, like the three of us would just go, it was like such a treat, right? Like as a family to enjoy together. Um, and so when we immigrated to Canada, we try to replicate that kind of experience for, you know, for all of the reasons you can imagine, but mostly for like nostalgic purposes, reasons. Um, but also just to kind of like re recreate that sense of home. Um, and we can never match like the spice level though, um, that uh, oh those shops in Taiwan <laughs> provided. Like, I think you even sometimes have to sign like a waiver cause it's just like too spicy. Oh my God. I don't know, I, I probably made that up. <laughs> um, but food obviously like in its connection to family and the sense of like familial, familialness um is so integral to i think how we all experience like how we share food and break bread around the yeah. table um and yeah yeah it makes me it makes me think about um you know we've had this jen we've had this conversation around like comfort food too and, and the the sort of the impacts that, that it has for people in a diaspora or have a diaspora mm -hmm experience you know i was mentioning though like there's there's certain things that bring back like a certain feeling of warmth mm -hmm. um, but some of them i'm like why did i like this like i don't know do you know like haw flakes they're like made of hawthorn berries yeah. i i bought it one day in chinatown because i was like oh i like i have this really fond memories of so my great grandmother my on my um, my mom's dad's mom um, lived in an SRO um, in the downtown east. I just right beside Chinatown, and she was almost blind. And uh, and so she, but she she really really loved us. And you know, I was like four or five, but I have these really vivid memories of her giving us uh, haw flakes and unfortunately like rotten fruit because she couldn't see. Um, so she would often give us like fruit out of you know she wanted to give us these things. Um, but I have this memory of the haw flakes. But I bought it the other day and I was like, why did I like these things? They don't taste that good. Well, it, it, it makes sense, right? Because of like the sensory, like the like the sensory associations with with that, like it just you know, it helps us recall those memories of us growing up. And we often have very fond memories 
childhood trauma notwithstanding, but we, you know, we have fond memories of how we grow up and the environment we grow up. Um, I can share a story of how my mom to this day, probably like once or twice a month, she will prepare her lunch. And like she lives at home. She doesn't have, she doesn't go anywhere. Um, so she, but she still prepares this lunch and she'll put it in this like tin metal container. It's like a lunch box. It's like a bento box, but it's metal because um, so kids growing up in Taiwan, I'm, I'm sure they still do this now. Um, everybody, you know, kids would bring to school the um, their lunch boxes, our lunch boxes. And what we would do is during lunchtime, the school would have this like giant steam steamers, I guess. Um, and they would just slot these lunch boxes into these like giant stacks of like, you know, machines. And then it would just steam everybody's lunches, um, which is like, now that I think about it, it's such an efficient way of like heating up, you know, kids' food. So my mom, you know, I, I remember that maybe for like five, well, three years because in elementary school and then I moved to Canada. But my my mom certainly has a lot of, um, I guess, nostalgia towards that experience. So she, she like replicates that childhood experience with the like metal bento boxes. It's really adorable and really cute. Yeah. I love that. Beautiful. I want, um, I, I, Claire, do you want to maybe uh, introduce to us United Aunties? And I, maybe it'll also just make the connection. So mm -hmm. I actually invited you because so Value Co-op, I, I saw, I, so I'm a part of the communications team and I saw that we had posted these amazing white rabbit candy or these buttons. Um, oh, you're wearing it, yes. <laughs> So we the made OG them. ones. Yeah, so they're, yeah. they're these white uh, buttons made of white rabbit candy and you posted an image and then we reposted it on our channels. And then I went to your um, website and I was just so excited about what you were up to with United Antis. Do you want to maybe share a little bit about what, what that is? Sure, yeah. It's um, United Antis was formed in the fall of 2020 last year after so many months of isolation and really just trying to um, grapple with this collision of global crises that were happening. Mm -hmm. um, so Leo, my husband works in Chinatown as well uh, and has for many years. And so we started thinking about how we might want to respond to these really huge seismic shifts on um, a small scale. So wanting to try to bring back a sense of connection and uh, in a community that we are so heartened to be a part of, uh, Chinatown. And so um, it was born out of that sort of seed of an idea. And um, I guess to, to talk a bit about, about, about um, what spurred it, uh, Leo has a bit of an interest in cooperatives and the cooperatives model. Um, this idea that you know people could own and operate uh, an initiative or an organization and really democratize the economy, share in decision making. And um, so we started to talk about what that might look like. So for temporarily, we sort of shelved the idea. Um, uh, and so for me coming at, at uh, United Aunties from a perspective of an artist who works by myself, I'm a photographer. My art practice is a solo art practice. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about um, connections and community. Mm -hmm. And um, also because the last couple of years, I've been super grateful to POC curators and artists and cultural workers who've invited me to come be part of um, you know, artist talks, uh, artist projects, um, things that, uh, exhibitions, things that are, um, you know, oftentimes have a grassroots uh, feel to them. Mm -hmm. And also things that oftentimes are not funded by, you know, major institutions like art councils. So that's kind of where I've been thinking about how to grow and challenge myself as an artist is um, having a bit of a, a socially minded component, a community focus. And so United Aunties was born from there. 
Um, we launched a market in the fall, uh, October, November, and we um, feature a curated selection of art and crafts by local producers in uh, Metro Vancouver. And we really, when we put the call out uh, for vendors, really wanted people who had some sort of connection to place. Um, so whether it's someone who's um, participating in the Powell Street Festival every year, or sits on the board of directors at a local artist run center, we were looking for people who, um, yeah, who had, who were rooted somewhere. And so um, it, it started there, but actually we, um, David and Jen, I hadn't been mentioning to you guys, like it actually started where Leo and I were talking about fish. Um, and um, our, we have a friend who runs a family business, a second generation um, oh, yeah. business that sells food, uh, fish caught off the coast of, uh, of BC. And so we were thinking like, you know, the restaurant industry has been so hard hit this year. Maybe we can like help help them out as well and help out local producers. And it, you know, and from there it kind of snowballed into thinking about like, well, we also have a friend who does, who makes kimchi really, really well. Maybe we can like help them out too and like highlight the cool things they're doing. So logistically it proved to be a bit of a, a <laughs> challenge. And so we, you know, we kiboshed that really quickly. And we then brought it back to, to the art um, scene and the, the arts and culture scene. And so we are, have worked with um, some artists and artisans who are fantastic at what they do and really just trying to support them during this year that's been so hard for mm -hmm. artists and for local small businesses. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the roots of where United Aunties was, uh, was born. Amazing. Um, Claire, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of your work. I think your photography is amazing. Um, can I just quickly interject because I want to do this on camera before all my ice cream melts. Yes. <laughs> uh, so Claire, we have this uh, back and forth on Instagram. So as pe people probably saw, uh, we released a bunch of um, promo images of, of uh, me and Jen and Matt, the next guest next week, um, on this really famous hot sauce um, and the LGM, I can't pronounce it, LGM hot sauce. And Claire, you said that this chili oil is good on vanilla ice cream. Yes. <laughs> Can you tell us wh wh where you where did you learn this? And then I'm going to do it for the first time on camera. <laughs> oh, my oh my God. God. <laughs> um, there is a, I think it's Toronto based. There is an ice cream company that started a Laokanma like flavor. And so it came across my feed on IG and I was with my with my family back in Ontario. I can't remember when now, but my mom started churning her own vanilla ice cream. Like it's super easy to make actually. And so we all had put chili crisp onto the vanilla ice cream and it was heavenly. So wow. really? okay, I'm gonna try. Oh. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> oh my god, David, you're so brave. Oh my god. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. good. It's what? good. Because it's, I was like, I don't know how this is going to work because LGM hot sauce is salty too. Yeah, it's I nice. guess it's, it's creating kind of, that umami flavor. Or it's yeah. like, like what I would salty. relate it to, like, like salted caramel, you know? Yeah, yeah. That sort of, wow, all right. Okay. I, I will try this on my oh. own. Yeah, <laughs> not in front of the camera. <laughs> Claire, I'm curious. Um, Incredible. Why, why aunties? Why did you uh, want to or, or center aunties in, in your in 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 that in that work? I love the name. I just love the yeah. name. Yes, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Oh man, I mean, aunties are so prevalent, and really, I think we Leo and I didn't realize how significant aunties are until our son Theo was born in. Uh, in 2019 and we were just blown away by friends um coming through with like hand-me-downs and food and just care and warmth and these are theo's aunties he's got so many aunties and really it's just trying to honor this sort of spirit of giving and care mm -hmm. and um you know aunties are like i i'm been an auntie long before I, I was a, a parent myself and just anyone can 
channel the spirit of an auntie. And that's kind of what we were thinking about because we had been playing with the idea of like, could our name be like aunties and uncle? But we really want to like honor the auntie spirit because, you know, we're trying to, um, we're thinking a lot about like, we have a friend who is uh, a queer man and he identifies himself as an auntie. And we just really was like inspired by that spirit. And so mm -hmm. for us, we kind of started thinking about, well, what is an auntie? It's someone who um, holds this cultural knowledge and is able to disseminate it in this really beautiful way um, that's, that's so powerful too. Um, there's someone who is so good at what they do, whether it's cooking or art making, um, and somebody who fights for their communities. That's something that's really important to us. Really thinking a lot about like the Chinatown popos and aunties who like are fighting gentrification. It's so powerful to see as a young person. And so really definitely just trying to honor aunties and anyone can be an auntie. So it is gender roles are not fixed at all. Yeah, that resonates with me so much because, um, you know, of this idea of like queer chosen family, right? And um, we're all made up of like the people around us, the communities that we're raised in, and that in fact, we inform one another, we raise each other, we learn from one another. And um, I'm someone that um, will like, will not have kids, but I'm, I'm kind of known in my close circle of friends that I'll be their kids as, um, future fairy goth mother. And it's like a role that I'm just, I'm just like dying for th their kids to be born because I, I can't wait to play that role of the fairy goth mother or the kooky weirdo activist auntie that is, you know, gonna take you sh shopping and dress you and talk to you about politics and music and culture. Um, I think those are all so important, you know, yeah, just like non, non unconventional and non mainstream kind of like worlds, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, the yeah. last thing we want is to create more conventional. <laughs> yeah. No, I I love that. I, I resonate so much with both of what you are you're saying, um, Claire. I totally identify as an auntie. I think yeah. I'm an auntie to one kid so far. <laughs> Hands <laughs> up. <laughs> And I'm an auntie to a couple dogs too. <laughs> but I also think about, you know, and aunties have played a really big role in, in my life too, um, particularly my dad's sisters. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, Claire, you said something about like thinking of there's arts that are um, different arts that are valued differently or in thinking about what arts are even valued. I think about, so my, my aunties in particular were, are the keepers of the, um, they make the tonics, so the soups. And so, you know, the, the, the Chinese soups that are, you know, almost every, um, that they, they would deliver to us every week, um, uh, you know, depending on the season, depending on the weather, depending on your, your, your health needs. Um, and, you know, I think about how important that role was in my community, in my family, um, and that, that it's a vital uh, cultural role that they played, but it's not, you know, it, it wouldn't, and I believe it's an art form, um, but you know, we don't value those types of care labor, Claire, as you were saying, yeah. um, in different ways that other labor is, is valued too. Um, totally. Yeah. It's, and being in the art world too, just like trying to counter what's out there in terms of like neoliberal ways of, of performance and productivity. It's so, it's it's wreaking havoc on people's lives. And so I think this year, what this year has really shown us is like the need for rest and care and like immersing yourself in things that are going to, you know, boost you up, empower you and surrounding ourselves with like amazing people or tonics. Yeah, I mean, immersing yourself at a distance or virtually from, from uh, from aunties and mm -hmm. that's something I think yeah. David you said you were missing a lot with this pandemic and yeah one of the it's what, what, what's been kind of nice though is um so in the be I remember so last April when everything got shut down one of the I, 
um, Jen and I had an, an, uh, had an exhibit at the Sum Gallery, and we weren't able to do what the closing ceremony with um, uh, Made in China, which was the uh, grave sweeping ceremony. And it kind of made me a bit sad. This is, keep in mind, this was at the beginning of the pandemic, right? So where all of the sort of sinking in of social isolation was really taking weight. And so I, I did this, um, this uh, the three three part piece where I adapted a bunch of um, Chinese ceremonies and I, I included the tonic making as a as a as one of those ceremonies and sort of adapted it to quarantine um, conditions and I kind of carried it on after I, I did it in April and it's been kind of nice um, it's you know it's basically just me dropping off soup to my aunties and it but and I it's been this sort of really nice sort of they keep asking me where did you learn this because they. <laughs> Uh, there's the internet now too, right? But they, they're also the holders of this knowledge. And they're also very, you know, I, I forget what I made them on the weekend, but they're like, how did you learn to clean this? Because I don't even know how to clean this. <laughs> so it's been kind of nice that I can sort of now also reciprocate some of those, um, this, despite, you know, not being able to share a meal with them, um, uh, like physically, I can sort of still um, facilitate some sort of, um, yeah, some sort of um, engagement with them, um, despite being apart, two meters apart. Claire, I have to admit, um, so I, I did some sleuthing. Um, I read your piece on medium and uh, on whiteness and the diasporic self through pregnancy, labor mm -hmm. and early parenthood. I That piece drew me to tears, uh, mm -hmm. or brought me to tears. Um, and then there's this one particular line that I really love that you wrote and it said, um, my mother born in the year of the snake, the fiercest lady I've ever known birthed four babies readily without a guide. And that line just really stayed with me all today um, as I was kind of preparing for this talk. Um, I'm curious if you um, wouldn't, be my, wouldn't mind if you can tell us a little bit about how you grew up. And I know you mentioned a little bit about growing up in Singapore. Um, but maybe tell us what your childhood was like, um, family, siblings, all of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. For sure. Oh, my mom's going to be so embarrassed that you brought her up. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Mom. <laughs> I have to. I love moms. Yes, they <laughs> should. Oh, man, yeah. I grew up in, I was born in Singapore. Um, I'm the second of four kids. And we moved in the mid 90s to Mississauga, Ontario. And, um, you know, became a family of six uh, then. And it's really fascinating because I've been kind of, I did an art piece with my mom in, um, in the fall that was, um, you know, thankfully funded by Arts, the BC Arts Council. And I was thinking a lot about labor. I've been thinking about labor for like the last year and a half, having become a parent and like really struggling with notions of work and self and valuing the self. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, my parents gave up everything in Singapore for us. It was, a, it's a story that's not, not new, right? With immigrant parents. Um, yeah, they left really good careers because they wanted us to not be, uh, you know, be pressured by the schooling system in Asia, which is super harsh and just wanted to give us opportunity. And so it's really um, fascinating because I think a lot about whether or not I would be an artist if I stayed in Singapore, if, you know, if those doors would be open to me. And um, yeah, my parents just, yeah, they, they did everything for us. And, and I mean, we were, I would say, I think thinking about it now, like kind of isolated in the Canadian suburbs because we didn't have any family, no relatives in Ontario. And so our world was like the six of us, right? And so it's kind of informing, like I, I have so much admiration for everything they've done and just this, this idea that they can, yeah, just drop everything and take like basically move to a brand new country, right? And um, so thinking a lot about like matriarchs and aunties and really wanting to, um, with our family, like try to carve out a place where, you know, our own concept of what home is. 
um, having ties to our Chinese culture. That's something that's really value. Um, that's something that we really value. Um, cause my parents, yeah, they, they try to do as much of that as possible, but I think, you know, for parents trying to strike a line between assimilation yeah. and just trying to get by, I mean, through this art piece that I did with my mom, I didn't know this. I mean, I guess maybe I forgot about the memories, but she said she like gave us a lot of frozen foods because that was like what was marketed and what was cheap. Yeah. And so it's this really fascinating journey that I feel like maybe she, my mom and I are both on where now they've got an empty nest in their home. And my mom is like returning to cooking all sorts of things from scratch. Like she was hanging up Chinese cured meats in the garage like a couple weeks ago. And I was like, holy smoke, <laughs> what is this? Uh, so I feel like she and I are maybe on this interesting parallel journey where I'm trying to reclaim my heritage by learning to make soups and and different foods and like obviously try to tap into her knowledge as much as possible. And she, you know, now that her home, like all the kids have moved out is, is also like, yeah, she's making things from scratch. That's so admirable. And like, she would have never been able to do when she was caring for, you know, four kids growing up. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's something I've been thinking a lot about is like, this notion of labor that's not wage, she gave up a career when yeah. she moved to Canada. And everything that she's done since over the last 25 years has been unwaged. And so this, this grant that I got from BC Arts Council, like I got her paid the same amount as I got paid. And that was really important for me to do because like it's, it's tiny, right? But I really wanted to honor what she was doing um, uh, and what mm -hmm. she's done in terms of like, yeah, caregiving work. Yeah, totally. And, you know, I, I, I've struggled a lot with um, identifying as an artist for even, you know, when Jen and I started um, Love Intersections, um, you know, which was, Jen, can you believe it? It's almost seven years. Ten, I don't believe it. Time, time does not, I don't understand time. Uh, yeah. It's not a concept I understand. <laughs> <laughs> and like, you know, and I think about why, why, what was going through my head, you know, what is an artist, you know, and I, and I think oftentimes even my parents, and I think my parents might be watching too, so they're going to be really embarrassed, but I think sometimes they're, they wonder like, what exactly do you do? Are you, are you feeding yourself through these strange projects that you get up to? And I think, but I think that's, that's it, right? It's like, even mm -hmm. this that we're doing right now is, 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 is work, right? And, but we, we sort of value different types of work differently under, you know, under white supremacy, under patriarchy, under yeah. colonialism, these different sort of the, uh, systems that we, we, we navigate. And I think about like, and we've been thinking about this at the co-op too, and, and I think this is okay to share, but one of the things that I've realized in, 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 in starting value co-op is the, how the, the relational pieces and the organizing pieces go totally hand in hand. In fact, I would argue that the relational pieces way outweigh the organizing pieces because if you don't have trust you don't have the foundation on which to do to do the work right um and so i've been really thinking about that in all of the work that we've been doing and um you know um jen our work in with love intersections that sort of established um relationality that we do with our community when we create art projects i'm now starting to try to piece that into the other other uh, uh, other work that I do as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. What can I say? Relationships. <laughs> <laughs> Move at this the hardest time. thing though. The it's hardest. so hard, honestly. It's 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 the hardest thing. Um, I Claire, I I I want to really talk about like some of the ethics around. Well, maybe not even ethics, but like being an artist and being an artist that. You know, you ha you mentioned Theo, your son. Do you have fears, and I imagine you do. But do you? Ha what are your fears in raising your son in today's and the future's climate? Um, I'm I'm genuinely so so curious because I I see Gen Z culture like the generation Gen Z. I'm actually such a fan of because they're just fearless 
and not in the fearless way where they're eating Tide Pods kind of fearless. I'm talking about fearless as in they're really like owning um, their like subculture and they're, they're, they're really out there producing art and it's kind of, it's very in, in, embodied. Um, whereas I feel like I'm an older millennial, so is David. Um, and even like Gen X and, you know, and, and those of us who are older, um, you know, I think there was more tension in the, in the like intersections of like art making and, yeah, and just like the tensions around that. Um, I'm not being very articulate around this question that hopefully will formulate soon. Um, I'm just curious if you have any kind of insights in your, you know, how you're raising your your kid, your your son, and yeah, as an artist yourself and as a mother. Mm hmm. I mean, just thinking about my youngest sister is 11 years younger than me, and just thinking about how she was in high school. Holy smokes, just like light years ahead of me in terms of being, you know, I hate this word, but woke, mm -hmm. right? And so it's incredible to think about the future generations, the kids who are babies right now and what what type of world they're going to be living in uh, mediated, by mediated by technology and other, other, other systems. Um, but for me, I mean, the prevalence of white supremacy is definitely something that I think... I worry about for Theo yeah. and thinking a lot about like the school systems and uh, what type of experience he will have. Um, mm. Thinking a lot also about like Asian masculinity mm. and how that will be, um, how his his navigation of it will be like. I mean, yeah. I, I was, you know, I entered the Canadian school system when I was in grade five and I, I, you know, it was relatively, you know, fine, but just dealing with like the overwhelming, uh, I don't know, feelings of, of seeing whiteness everywhere. That's something that I grappled with, sure. And, but I, I don't know, I mean, like Vancouver is pretty diverse, so maybe his experience compared to me in like the Ontario suburbs in the 90s will be vastly different. But I do worry about how he's going to navigate it. I mean, we are going to try to like, give him as broad a worldview as possible. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, you just never know with like peer pressure or yeah, just expectations from pop culture or what have you, like what that will be like in, you know, five, 10 years when he enters the school system and starts to get influences from outside of our radius. Yeah. So that's definitely probably like my biggest fear for him. Wow. Yeah, totally. It reminds me, yeah, when I was, when I graduated from high school, I really sort of recognized the power of socialization. So I went to, I went to Eric Hamber, which is a very predominantly Asian mm -hmm. hospital. All the cool kids, all the cool kids were Asian. <laughs> this was when uh, David was raving. <laughs> <laughs> when I was a candy raver. I was a very dedicated candy raver. Too. I, wore, yeah. I, wore, I wore it to school. Oh. <laughs> My SpongeBob backpack to school. But you know, when then I reckon, and then when I, when I came out, um, when I graduated um, from high school and I came out as queer and started getting more integrated into the queer community, it was very quickly, I noticed how, what, what who was desirable yeah. was very quickly changed. And yeah, just really what, what you shared was just like, wow, the, yeah, the power of socialization um, and the community um, that, we're, that we're a part of, yeah. yeah. Claire, um, you are launching something today, um, Envelope. Yeah. Can, you, can you tell us about Envelope? Sure. I've got my little white rabbit uh, pin here that uh, Value Co-op uh, made for us. Um, Envelope is a mail art exchange of completely free mail art exchange that we are opening up to people in the uh, Metro Vancouver area. Uh, we really want to foster a sense of art making um, in a collaborative way while people are still sheltering in place for the next you know, foreseeable future. 
Um, so the heart of it is you can register to participate. Uh, you don't have to be an artist. Um, you just have to be uh, based in Metro Vancouver. And we really also just want to um, sort of nudge people that that uh, if you're going to participate in this project too, that you are um, respect and value the same uh, things that we do. Um, so there are justice and liberation movements that we are committed to uh, uplifting. And so, you know, if you kind of align with us, we welcome your participation. So we will send you a, uh, a free mail art kit with almost all the art supplies. So just like a card that you will be able to make your artwork on. And the heart of it is um, you're going to be paired up anonymously um, with somebody else who's participating in the project as a bit of a call and response. So one of you will be a call, one of uh, the other person will be a response. So the idea is that you'll get to create art and sort of engage with each other in a, in a distance way. And so we're hoping that we'll just spark some cool community connections, let people make some art. Um, and we're hoping to um, ship out the first batch of uh, art kits in the, in the next week. And there are still spots available. So we're um, encouraging people to sign up on our website. And you'll also get one of these pins. I should really say that. Um, and I don't know if you guys have ever looked at the wrapper, but there's like an artist palette on there. Like if it's an oil, um, a painting, uh, not palette. Yeah, a palette on oh. there. Like it's got some weird, I don't know, the, the full history of the white rabbit candy, but it's so fascinating to me and it's super nostalgic. So just trying to give a little shout out to white rabbit candies and um, say thank you to our participants. So you'll get a little pin in the mail as well. Amazing. And um, for those who are watching, um, Cameron has just dropped the link to um, Enveloped into the comments so you can you can head straight there. <laughs> cool. I wish I had known you were going to wear that pin. I actually have a White Rabbit um, t-shirt. <laughs> oh, amazing. So cool. <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, <laughs> what should we talk about next? <laughs> I don't know. I kind of just figure conversations naturally have its ebb and flow. And, you know, when the time feels right for us to end the talk, then it feels right. Is it, it maybe it's now? Um, well, it is 547. So we have been talking for almost 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, maybe Claire, do you, do you have any questions for David and I? Yeah, I mean, Jen, I want to know about like the aunties in your life mm -hmm. as well. I mean, you aspire to be this amazing auntie. Are there some aunties in your life who've like given you some real like memories and feelings? Um, you know, it is really interesting because my my whole backstory is a hot mess. But I will say, um, so my parents are like hardcore Buddhists. And so I'm an only child if it's not so extremely deathly obvious to people. <laughs> um, but I don't, I try not to be the only child stereotype. Um, but sometimes I can, I, I don't really know how to share food. Um, if, if my partner reaches for a fry, I will literally buy them another fry, a French fry. Um, I, that's but that's the only thing. Everything else in my life, I can I can do sharing relationship. You know, <laughs> the food is is something I, I don't really um I don't have experience. But okay, so um on aunties, so they're Buddhists. Um, so they brought me over to Canada uh, a large part to actually escape the kind of political and education system in Taiwan, but also to escape from like familial. Uh, it's like this Buddha suffering thing. So, um, which isn't to say that they didn't raise me in like a, a loving household, um, but they they just really shielded me from the drama that they had experienced in their respective families. Um, and so, I, I I I grew up as an only child in in Port Moody, uh, quite lonely, but also I made like sense of myself 
by playing with myself. I cultivated a sense of play by myself. And so I just hung out in the forest um, next to my house by myself for a good chunk of like my, from the age of you know nine to, to, to 14. So quite formative years. So I attribute a lot of my like eccentricities and, and weirdness to that period of time. Um, so I never had any like adults who I looked up to who could mentor me. And, and not to mention, um, it was just me and my dad too. So I was kind of raised by my father here because my mom was back in Taiwan making money and sending it over to us. So the, it was often reversed um, where it was the mom would come with their kids and then the dads would be back in their home countries making money, sending it over while well, it was switched in my in my case. So um, I always say that my my for my parents, my dad did the spiritual work where he meditates for like six hours a day and left me alone. And, and my mom did the like, bring home the bacon, the financial work uh, back in Taiwan. So um, long story short, I would say that I didn't find any kind of um, elder or mentorship, um, uh, any of that until I was well into my early 20s where I promptly joined the queer community and was like, let's do this. And so I, I found that I it was the queer, queer queer mamas in my life that really brought me under their wings. I can name a few today, like the Lori McIntoshes and the Lisas and the, um, you know, even the Amber Dons, right? These are the people that really brought me into their care. And that's where I learned relationship. It was through community, queer community specifically. Yeah. Cool. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yeah, at another at another time, I can talk a little bit about my not tonight, but about growing up in a Buddhist monastery. But I'll save that for Ooh. next time. <laughs> that's cool. Well, maybe that's a good place to wrap up. We have some really exciting announcements, though, so I don't I don't want people to run away. Um, first, uh, so I, I saw some of the comments. Someone asked about. Um, providing or, or putting together hot pot packs. Well, guess what? We're actually putting together hot pot packs for, for sale. Um, oh so we're actually, it's really cool. We've asked all of our panelists to um, email us um, their favorite hot pot ingredients. Ingredient. Um, and we're, so we're gonna make a little list. Um, we, we're gonna source them all, all the ingredients um, from uh, stores in uh, Chinatown. I did a little tour yesterday. I live just not too far from Chinatown. So I, 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 I did some sourcing. Um, so they are for sale. I think Cameron's gonna drop the link um, in the comments as well. Um, so they're for pre-sale and we're only gonna, and we're gonna um, release them or we're, they're gonna be ready for pickup um, at, at the finale. So um, probably at the, that's the third week of March. Um, so we'll let you know. Um, and there's also going to be a special edition. Um, we, I, we, the bag hasn't been designed yet, but we'll, 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 we'll announce it when the design has been done. It's gonna be a special edition. So you'll get a tote bag um, and you'll get the box of um, hot pot ingredients. Um, so yeah, uh, if you want to purchase them, the link is, uh, link is in the comments. And, uh, we have, uh, we were running a dumpling contest. <laughs> so we're going oh, sorry, to- Can I interject real quick? Somebody in the chat was asking if Claire will send the mail to Edmonton, but I think you already answered. It was in, just in the lower mainland, right? Yes, Metro, Metro Vancouver. Vancouver folks. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, I just had to answer. No worries, no worries. Go for it, David. All right, dumpling winners. <laughs> Are we gonna do a drum roll? Um, yeah, so this, I have to say also, this was so freaking popular. <laughs> <laughs> I've never, our Instagram was just like, whoa. <laughs> so, um, so sorry for the people that did, aren't gonna win, um, but let me pull up the winners. Jen and I did a randomized draw earlier. Um, the winner is, so should we do a drum roll? And the winner is XKKX and Ashy Luke. Yay! Yay! Congratulations! Congratulations! Um, so DM us or DM the Dumpling King. Um, he has the dumplings for you, and we'll coordinate the pickup. We'll also get in touch with you after this um, after this episode. Great! 
I think that's yeah. it. Um, why don't we announce next week's guest, which is the Dumpling King. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Ne next week's guest is uh, Matt Murtag Wu, who's the, also AKA the Dumpling King. Um, we're super excited to have him um, join us uh, to talk about to, to talk about all the things. So please join us next week, same time, uh, 5, uh, 5 p.m. Pacific time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Claire. It was so nice to chat with you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, David, for having me. Such Yay. a pleasure. <laughs> Yay. Have a good night, everybody. Good Thank night. you. Good night. Stay safe. You too. <laughs>